Welcome to the New Thinking for a New World podcast, where we explore the most pressing issues that are challenging and changing our societies. We are looking for new thinking and new solutions wherever we can find them. Listen as host Alan Stoga, the Talberg Foundation's chairman, challenges his guests for analysis, ideas and actions. Together, we can help make our world at least a bit better. India looks to be on a roll. The country has now surpassed China as the world's most populous nation. India's geopolitical importance is recognized by its current presidency of the G20, which means Prime Minister Modi will host the annual Global Leaders Summit in September. Modi's BJP, in power since 2014, is widely expected to win next year's general election, not the least because the Indian economy is growing at a 6% clip, far and away the fastest growth among major countries. And despite the government's nationalist agenda and the country's legendary bureaucracy, India is attracting international investors, both because of its perceived dynamism and because foreign investment in its great rival, China, is looking a bit dicey. Is India the new China? or maybe an alternative to China for the rest of the global South as well as the West? And is India's continuing rise inevitable? Answers to those questions turn on whether India can leverage all those people, their evident entrepreneurial and business capacities, modern technology, and more political stability than the country has seen in a long time into sustained prosperity. Or will underlying centrifugal forces of religion, inequality, and nationalism define India's next chapter. My guest today spends much of his time trying to parse the answers. Milan Veshnaf is a senior fellow and director of the South Asia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington. He understands India from inside and from outside, which gives him the advantage of both sides now. Welcome, Dr. Veshnaf. Thank you so much for having me. I know you focus on India's political economy, on the nitty gritty of how India actually works. But let me start with the 60,000 foot question. India is both a rich and a poor country, a $3 trillion economy where the per capita income is something like $2,400 and only a bit more than a quarter of the households earn more than $10,000 per year. How does India cope with those extremes? You know, India in some ways is more analogous to the European Union than it is to the United States. When you think about the diversity, not just in terms of per capita income, but in terms of language, in terms of culture, um, in, in terms of kind of local local traditions, um, you know, we forget, for instance, that India's most populous state, the state of Uttar Pradesh, has upwards of 230 million people, right? It would be the fifth largest country in the world if it were its own country. Um, and you're quite right that it is a, a confederation of extremes. You know, the three richest states in the Indian Union are three times richer than the three poorest states. I think the way that this has gotten ironed out is through a couple of mechanisms. One is democracy, right? There is a pretty deep-seated commitment to um, finding peaceful ways of resolving disputes. You know, India is uh, not wasn't only you know the poorest country ever to adopt universal suffrage. It's also the the longest standing. A democracy in the developing world. I think it's important for your listeners to to, to remember that. Uh, the second is that you know there is a very elaborate system of compensatory transfers that take place from the central government to the states. Uh, the states do the vast majority of the spending, but the center is the one that collects the vast majority of the taxes. Right, so there's very intricate formulas that uh, uh, allow for that decentralization that process to take place. And I think the third part of the answer is, is you know, under the Constitution, states are uh, quite uh, – have a lot of agency, right? Uh, this is a, a robustly, you know, federal – uh, country it does have some centralizing tendencies we can we can talk about um, but on most aspects of day to day governance um, people look to their state capitals and to the to their chief minister 
uh, the equivalent of, of governors of the United States, not necessarily to the prime minister or to the elected parliament. Let's talk about both economics and then politics and particularly democracy. As measured by GDP per capita, India and China were almost exactly the same in 1995. Fast forward to 2023, China's GDP per capita is something like five times greater than India's. Now, we could talk for hours about what happened between then and now, and we don't have hours. So let me ask a different question. Is India now doing what it takes to accelerate on a sustained basis domestic growth and development? So... I think there's a half full and half empty answer to this. And let me give you both. I think on the half full side, under this government, um, over the past 10 years or so, India has seriously upgraded its investments in what uh, people like to call the hardware of the economy, right? So there's been a digital payments revolution. 1.3 billion Indians have a unique biometric uh, identification number. Um, you have new laws on uh, that 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 streamline indirect taxes. You have a new law that creates uh, the possibility of, of of corporate bankruptcy. You have um, a huge explosion in terms of uh, the length breadth of rural roads, okay, uh, water, electricity, you can go down the line, right? And and, and the, the, these changes are, are palpable. Uh, and that is what I think gives a lot of people hope that, look, uh, India can I- enjoy the kind of transformative growth that, that China did in this period that you're talking about. The class half empty side, I think, has two components, okay? One is economic and one is political. The economic component is India has done a much better job building out the hardware of its economy than its software. What do I mean by software? Software refers to things like the rule of law, to policy certainty, to regulatory autonomy. Um, Basically, people don't want to invest and then find midstream that the rules have changed, right? And we see a lot of that in India, whether it's on taxation, whether it's on e-commerce, whether it's on foreign direct investment. And so, and the list goes on and on and on. This, the second part of, 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 of the answer really is about politics, where we are seeing a much more muscular, nationalistic government that is a Hindu first government, right? Um, they believe that India, if you look at it demographically, is 80% Hindu. And therefore, people who live in India should more or less abide by a package of Hindu kind of social and cultural tenets. Uh, Now, you might say, well, that makes sense. It's 80% of the population. But don't forget that that 20%, uh, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people because the overall population is 1.4 billion people. Not least, around 14% um, are are Muslim. You know, India, uh, Indians, India's Muslims are probably the world's single largest minority group, right? And so if you upset that delicate, balance uh, of democracy and diversity, I think that could, over the long run, have negative economic impacts. I was going to wait to get to Prime Minister Modi and the BJP, but probably should. We should go there now since you, since you just raised it. Uh, I have to confess that as a Westerner, I cannot understand Modi. I, he clearly is a, an extremely successful politician. Uh, he's been in office for a long time. Looks like he has a long time left. Uh, He seems to dominate uh, not only a very large country, but one that has a history of fractious politics, to put it mildly. Um, And as you've just said, has done remarkable things during his his time as leader. How should we think about Modi uh, as a religious nationalist uh, who is a Hindu president or as a modernizing leader who is taking India from whatever century he founded in and pulling it into the 21st century? Well, I mean, you know, the unsatisfactory answer, Alan, is is both, right? Let's start with the BJP, the ruling party. I don't think we in the West have a very good vocabulary for understanding the BJP because the BJP doesn't look like a conventional political party in the sense that uh, you look at the Republican Party or, or the Christian Democrats, uh, or the Labour Party in the UK. 
The Republicans may be the bad comparison, so let's, but but your point is, but you know, taken. if you, you think about the universe, for instance, of, of center right, roughly speaking, parties, right, in which the BJP you could argue fits in, um, it is a political wing of a larger social movement. Okay, this social movement is comprised of more than three dozen organizations ranging from a volunteer corps to a students union to a labor union to a women's wing to an agriculturalist movement. Um, And the BJP is its political expression, which means that it derives quite a lot of power from civil society. It is a Cotter based party uh, in every sense of the word. And what unifies all of these disparate organizations is a commitment to Hindutva or Hinduness, right? This idea that, uh, to put it very simply for your listeners, Indian culture and Hindu culture are coterminous, right? They should be one in the same thing. Uh, Narendra Modi comes from this movement, right? He's, he, 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 he cut his teeth as a, a schoolboy, basically, l- you know, learning this doctrine and then and spreading it uh, amongst the masses, right? And worked his way up, um, much like you would in, you know, if you're, you're a minor league baseball player, you work your way up to the big leagues. Well, the, the BJP, the political expression of this movement is, is the big leagues here. Um, so he is a true believer in this ideology. There's no question about that. At the same time, uh, he has proven himself to be a very effective administrator. He was the chief minister, again, equivalent to our governor in the United States, of the state of Gujarat for more than a dozen years. And it's worth noting that this state, which is you know a mid-sized state by Indian standards, was the f- f- had the fastest growing GDP growth rates of any state. Uh, during the time that Modi was the chief minister. Now, Gujarat has had a rich legacy of uh, growth and investment, but Modi took that growth and, and, and he increased it even further. So his claim to fame when running, campaigning for prime minister in 2014 was, you've seen what I've been able to do in Gujarat. Let me do that for the country. Now, in making that statement, again, there's two components to that. There is this more hardline a strain of Hindu nationalism. And and there's this belief that India uh, has to become a modernizing country that can be not just an economic powerhouse, but that can be a global geopolitical powerhouse, right? So Modi talks about India being a balancing power for generations. He says, no, under my rule, India should become a leading power. He's also somehow presided over a period of, I don't want to call it tranquility, uh, but of a dramatic reduction in institutional violence, something you've written about in in some of your work. Uh, And clearly, India's backstory is a violent backstory, certainly from partition on. uh, It's pretty nasty in, in the late 20th century. And there's still outbursts. We had recently in Northeast India, um, some violence that, uh, well, communal violence, all sorts of background to that story that's not particularly relevant to this conversation. Again, is it Modi? Is it the BJP? Is it something else in going on that has led to this reduction, at least, of violence, which is so important to success both in politics and in economics? Well, I, I think these are trends that predate Modi, uh, and and Modi has 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 continued them. Um, you know, it's worth pointing out that India is still a very young country. It's celebrating its seventy fifth anniversary. So, if you go back and look at the European or American state building projects, these two were very messy, chaotic, and and quite violent at times, right? So, in some sense, India isn't all that different. It's just that it's doing so. Uh, it's playing out before our eyes in the 21st century. Uh, what we have seen, and the data are pretty clear on this over the past two decades, is a sustained decline in collective violence. And by that, I mean terrorism, uh, insurgency, communal riots, um, you know, even, even, even kind of student protests, um, uh, homicides, public displays of violence. Um, and, uh, you know, that is, I think, due to many factors. Uh, one is a consolidation of the, the state and the uh, really uh, 
overwhelming growth in the security apparatus, right? I mean, if you look, for instance, at the growth in Indian paramilitary and police forces, I mean, it's been exponential over the past two decades. Um, the second is that there, a lot of this violence was produced by, again, as part of the state building process and nation building process, disputes over caste in hierarchy, disputes over secessionism and incorporation, um, disputes uh, over, over, over class in some cases, right? And these are definitely not resolved, but um, there has been progress uh, on, on moving these forms of disputes away from sort of, you know, uh, extrajudicial pr processes and funneling them more into the kind of democratic mainstream of electoral politics, right? Um, Modi has certainly continued to invest in the building up and the strengthening of India's security state. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, but we also shouldn't lose sight of the fact that, you know, other forms of violence do appear to be on the rise. Uh, lynchings, for instance, right? Um, we've seen a spate of, of, of mobs, uh, largely uh, organized by Hindus lynching uh, Muslim men for doing things like allegedly seducing Hindu women and trying to convert them, or for illegally transporting cattle, which in some states is something that that's against the law. Um, so, uh, you know, there is a deep sense uh, amongst the Muslim minority community uh, of, of sort of anxiety um, and it's expressed through some of these public spectacles. The a lot of that violence is performative, so it's not necessary. It's like terrorism, right? It, it's meant to kind of uh, a, a create a, a theatrical performance and to into to, into uh, instill fear into people, not necessarily exact the highest number of lives. Let's stay with Modi for a moment. How critical is he to this essentially positive dynamic that you're describing? Obviously, there's a long way to go before India gets to where it's going. But is is he critical or is he the agent of the moment? Well, I think he is critical in the following sense, which is he has a, a really tremendous amount of public support. You know, to the extent that we can measure this, there is a poll from Morning Consult, which ranks global leaders um, based on domestic public opinion. And Modi's favorability is literally off the charts. Um, it's about 75%, according to this poll. Now, that's one poll you should take with a grain of salt. But the fact is that um, he did the unthinkable in 2014, which was to lead his party to a single party majority in parliament, a feat which had not been achieved in three decades since Indira Gandhi did it um, quite a long time ago. Uh, and not only did he do it in 2014, he repeated with a larger mandate. Uh, in, in 2019, right? So that alone is remarkable. He, the way I like to frame it, has the oratorical skills of a Barack Obama and the retail political instinct of a Bill Clinton, right? And it's very rare for a politician to be equally good at both things. And Modi is, is one of those people. So there is a big question mark about the sustainability of some of these gains, because if Modi were to exit from the scene, um, would there be a leader, say, in the BJP or elsewhere that would be able to take this uh, take this on? But there's no question that he has brought a, a new energy, um, a new kind of authority, but also a new concentration of power, right, which, which has pros and cons. Um, you're able to get stuff done. But you also are able to uh, circumvent or short circuit a lot of democratic safeguards as well, right? So there, there are trade-offs here. If you feel that the world lacks global leaders, please help support the Talberg Foundation programs. Individual donations are being accepted at talbergfoundation.org slash donate. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G Foundation. Dot org slash donate. Let's use that to segue to the climate question. There are incredibly scary forecasts out there about large swaths of India becoming more or less uninhabitable uh, because of a combination of excess heat and humidity, 
uh, within a few years. This is not a hundred. This is not the twenty one hundred stuff. It is the twenty thirty twenty forty stuff. Today, India is the third largest CO two emitter by volume and has committed to net zero only by twenty seventy, uh, which in practical terms, I would argue, means opting out of the at least the urgency around climate change, even while doubling down on strategies, understandable strategies. Uh, to bring hundreds of millions into modernity. How does that contradiction play out, do you think? Well, I think we have to also give credit where credit is due, right? In the sense that um, India has, over the past 10 years or so, uh, affected a dramatic increase in renewable energy at home. Um, and it's on track to meet, if not potentially best, its so-called NDCs or nationally determined contributions that it set for itself in accordance with the Paris Climate Accords, right? Um, and so if you look at solar capacity, if you look at uh, you know wind, if you look at the uh, investment in, in, in renewals, um, you know, that we're seeing historic uh, surges in all of those things. Now, it's true that uh, you know, coal continues to be the single biggest source of energy. It's about 55% of nationwide energy consumption, which is roughly the same proportion it was in the mid 1970s. Um, and so, you know, while India is doing quite a lot on the home front, uh, I think, you know, skeptics would point out that, look, its stated goals under the Paris Climate Pact are, are relatively modest. They're not really ambitious enough to deliver its fair share of emissions cuts. And so I do think that there is mounting pressure uh, externally, but also, frankly, internally from um, you know, domestic civil society, from think tanks and academics. Uh, you know, I think the one shortcoming here, um, and this is you know, not unique to India, is that it's not yet a the basis of popular political mobilization. Uh, anybody who has gone to Delhi uh, recently will, will remark at just how awfully polluted it is, particularly during the winter months, right? I mean, uh, it, it is, um, it, uh, you know, politicians in Delhi themselves have called this a, a kind of, you know, walking gas chamber. Um, yet this does not seem to move the needle very much when it comes to electoral politics. I think part of that is just a function of where India is on the socioeconomic spectrum, right? I mean, people are still uh, fighting and agitating for, um, you know, a basic social safety nets, a livable wage, uh, a, a job in the a formal sector. And so um, right now, I think for many people, these are seen as uh, would be good to have, but not necessarily vital. But we know that whether it is health, uh, sanitation, uh, you know, life expectancy, economic productivity, these are all things that are being hurt by um, this increasingly warm and very volatile climate. Then there's the Ministry of the Future scenario, Kim Robinson's book, where, as you know, uh, he posits a, a mass death event in India. 25 million people die in his dystopian future. And that leads India essentially to dropping out of global arrangements and saying, we're just going to focus on our own issues because you refuse to do what needs to be done. India's, and this is the half empty glass part of our conversation. India is still has per capita income of only $2,400. Uh, it has a population which the of where, it has a population that is slowing in its growth, but still expands. Uh, it, it's got all the positives and negatives of the law of large numbers. Those billion four, whatever the number finally tops out as, uh, live in a carbon-based economy. So they're by definition going to increase their emissions over time. Well, I mean, I think, you know, it's potentially, you know, catastrophic, obviously. Um, I mean, you know, I, when I uh, landed up in India for the first time after you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, I came on a day when it was 49 degrees Celsius, which is about 120 Fahrenheit. And, you know, there were stories in the paper of, you know, uh, the, 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 literally the pavement melting, right? <laughs> uh, a really dramatic sort of scenes. And, you know, in a place like Delhi, which is used to pretty, uh, obscene, uh, levels of heat, 
uh, even 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 her, you know sturdy Deliites were were uh, were up in arms about this. Um, you know, I think one of the things that India is mulling right now, um, and, and this has come out in a government uh, ministry report, is that it is it is considering a plan to stop building new coal fired. Um, uh, plants uh, across India, and, and you know this would affect uh, uh, things that have not already broken ground. So those beyond uh, uh, the kind of you know shovel ready. And this is a draft policy; it, it hasn't been approved by the federal cabinet, but it would signify, I think, a, a, a real uh, uptick in 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 how aggressive India wants to be. To essentially take on this question, I think it would, you know, also then you know, put some of the onus on China, which is one of the only major nations, if not the only, still openly adding kind of new coal-fired power plants, right? Um, now, there's huge questions about what this is going to mean to India's industrial states, um, which are huge contributors to the economy. You know, how are they going to produce the kind of electricity they need to just simply keep the lights on. Um, but I do think that we are starting to see an increase in the ambition, but also, you know, coming back to India's G20 leadership this year, a, 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 a rising tide of anger at the developed world for not living up to their stated commitments on green finance, on funds for climate adaptation, and so on and so forth. And so, you know, as we look out to that September summit, I expect this to be uh, you know, a key uh, agenda item for India. And in this, you know, they have been rallying quite a lot of support uh, amongst the global South, right? India now has exercised, I think, a really interesting role in the global South. Of course, this is a broad category. You can hardly claim that everybody's on the same page. But um, but I think that, you know, they are willing to up the ante now and feel like they actually have the leverage to do so. They have the leverage to do so. Why? Because many countries like the United States and the West are, are focused on the China challenge. And in focusing on the China challenge, India becomes absolutely central. Um, and so if you see the the new swagger with which Indian diplomats <laughs> seem to be strutting around, this is part of the reason why. Let's talk about that. The prime minister has recently been invited to Washington for a grand event. Apparently, it's supposed to be a good old-fashioned kind of state visit with all of the ruffles and flourishes. As you've just said, a lot of people in Europe and in particular the United States look to India as the possible replacement. I have air quotes in that word for China. Somehow, as they think about the global, how, how global political arrangements are made, India's in favor, China's out of favor. It's all a silly reframing of, of how the world works, but it's the reframing of the moment. How do you think about the rivalry between India and China with regard to the global South, with regard to global leadership? India certainly would like to see a much more multipolar setup, right? Uh, a polycentric setup is, 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 is the term of art. But we have to keep in mind that India still um, has a, a number of deficiencies when it comes to uh, becoming a, a clear peer competitor uh, of China. You, you mentioned, for instance, the discrepancy in per capita income. That's certainly one. Uh, secondly, is even when it comes to kind of, you know, the ability to project power abroad, right? Uh, India still faces uh, huge shortcomings in terms of uh, arming its military, of, of sustaining its military, of being able to move its its units, uh, you know, across great distances. Um, that is one reason it has been leaning on the United States and engaging more intensely than ever, I think, with 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 the Pentagon. Um, and you know, it is also a country that uh, let's not forget, it, you know, is a is a democracy. 
And, you know, people often talk about the democracy tax, right? That uh, because you have to bring everybody along, that can uh, kind of, uh, you know, put a ceiling on how fast you can grow and what you can do because, you know, you have to negotiate civil society, you have to negotiate subnational states, you have to negotiate uh, the independent judiciary and so on and so forth. And I think, you know, to some extent that is true. I would argue that that's a trade-off that's uh that's that's worth making right um and it's something that eventually in the chinese case obviously all kinds of possibilities about political instability because of the way china governs itself and so i think india has great power ambitions there's no doubt about that but whether it is on trade and its inability to really penetrate global supply chains whether it's on the brass tax of its kind of defense industrial complex, whether it's on the the economy, um, you know, all three of these fronts, um, you know, it has quite a long ways to go. Now, you could argue that it's moving in the right direction, right? Um, but I think, you know, m- many backers of India, frankly, many friends of India would argue that th- that the pace of change is not fast enough. China clearly has ambition to write the new rules of global engagement, Uh, whether that involves projecting military power, economic power, um, I hesitate to use the word, moral power. Uh, Clearly, that's what China wants. India, however, although it does want to be a great power and has the potential to be a great power, doesn't seem to have that same mission for itself to write the rules of how the world works. Or does it? Well, I think historically it has not. Um, You know, we have to remember that this was a country that had such grave uh, domestic developmental needs at the time of independence, right? That, um, you know, many of India's post-independence leaders were really focused on getting uh, their own house in order, right? How to raise people out of abject poverty, how to deal with these rigid inequalities, how to keep this fractious country with unprecedented diversity of religion, of caste, of language, and so on and so forth together. Um, And I, I would say over the past couple of decades, there's been a realization that India has a much greater role to play on the global stage. And when it comes to Mr. Modi himself, would argue that, you know, what he is seeking for, or what he is seeking, excuse me, is is not really uh, creating something new, but rather uh, revitalizing something of old, which was India, you know, was a world power at one point. Uh, And as he describes it, these are his words, it had to suffer through 12 centuries of slavery. Right at the hands of all kinds of foreign invaders, not least the the British Raj uh, most recently, and so uh, what he is trying to harken back to is this idea of India as a civilizational state that has a global presence. Right, um, but this is a relatively kind of new shift in ambition, um, and you know we have to remember that in many key global fora. Uh, just take the UN Security Council for one. India is really not present, right? Uh, India has been agitating for a long time to be given a greater role at, say, the international financial institutions like the World Bank and the IMF, right? And 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 the West has jealously, you know, guarded their role in these institutions. So, uh, India and China both have issues with the current "quote unquote" liberal international order, uh, perhaps for different reasons. Um, but it's not as if, uh, you know, India is, is, is clearly on the side of the U.S. and the West and all of these issues because they actually feel badly done by in many of these instances. Which is understandable. Let's end with this. You wrote recently, India may be touted as the next big thing, but as with any marketing campaign, one would be well advised to read the fine print. Uh, that's true. I wrote that in Foreign Affairs as part of a book review of a new book, a very pessimistic new book on India called uh, India is Broken by the Princeton economist Ashoka Modi. Um, so what do I mean by that? Uh, w- what are the headlines? The headlines are India is experiencing a geopolitical sweet spot. It is the fastest growing major economy in the world. It has recently surpassed China as the world's most populous country. Um, despite its uh, ambivalence about the Russian invasion of Ukraine, 
uh, it is still feted and courted by all major powers, including Western powers. Um, and, you know, we are seeing signs that global companies like Apple and Foxconn and others are uh, looking to India as they offshore from China, right? So I think this confluence of events has uh, ha- has led many people to think this is India's moment. But, you know, you scratch the surface and there are many questions, right, when you get to the fine print. Take the economy. You know, India still produces far few jobs. Uh, to employ the million people who are joining the labor force every month and will continue to do so for the next several decades, right? Uh, it, it is a country that has moved from agriculture to services, virtually skipping over manufacturing, right? Uh, that is uh, a, a unique trajectory for almost any you know, you know, major economy. Uh, politically, it has a guarantee of stability in the short term. We agree about that. But again, these kinds of social divisions that it, the current government is also stoking, particularly between Hindus and Muslims, could have all kinds of nasty, unintended consequences. Uh, on foreign policy, you know, there's no doubt that over the past three decades, India has moved into a closer embrace with the West and an alignment or a strategic convergence with the United States. But as the Russia-Ukraine example shows, right, um, uh, it is it is not an ally in that sense, right? There is a there is a convergence not necessarily a congruence, as my colleague Ashley Tellis uh, likes to put it. Um, so, you know, I think we have to be careful when we read these hyped up headlines to really pause and say like, okay, you know, these seem to be positive changes, but you know, what, what is the, the what, what are the details of how this is working out? Um, and, and, you know, what are the steps India has yet to take in order to fulfill its potential both at home as well as a power abroad? Now you've got me worried about what headline I can use on our podcast. <laughs> but it's a good problem to have. Thank you very much for the conversation and for your insights. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Please rate our show on Apple Podcast and subscribe. Meanwhile, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter at talbergfoundation.org to learn more about our work. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org. Thank you, and we'll be back again next week for another episode of Talberg's New Thinking for a New World. This podcast was brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation. <laughs>